At Gen Con 2015, I had the opportunity to pick up a little tiny game called Hue, which uh, was a uh, clever little card game that fits in this really tiny box. And I found out that it's from a set of games called Paco Game, which are all little card games that fit in these gum-sized packages. I was really impressed with the game. And so I was very excited to find out that in 2016, Chris Handy and the folks at Perplexed are coming out with a whole new set of Paco Game, Paco Game Set 2. And I was very fortunate enough to receive some advanced copies of these games to be able to preview them and give them a try. So these are very tiny games and very short games, and so I'm going to try to cram four reviews into one video. And so let's uh, get ready to take a look at all four of the new games in the Paco Game Set 2. There are four games in the new Paco game set too. Orc, Jim, So, and Rum. And even though these games have uh, short titles and all come in the same size box, they couldn't be more different. Uh, so let's take a look at the setup and gameplay of all four of these games, starting with Orc. So here's the setup for Orc. It's a two-player combat game where you are vying for these six different territories in six different colors. So you'll set up three cards that, have, that represent all six of the colors. And then next to each territory, you're going to deal out a stockpile of four cards. Uh, after you do that, there's going to be three cards left over. One player will get one card and go first, and the other player will get two cards. So on your turn, you're going to play one of these cards in front of one of the territories that you're trying to claim. And these cards have either one or two orcs on them, and there's two different colors on each card. And you can select which one you want to represent uh, your battling force for this particular battle. But the rules are is that whatever territory you put it down next to, the orcs that you're fighting with have to be a different color than the orcs of the territory that you're trying to claim. And if another player has already played a card there, then you actually have to have a different different color from both the territory and your opponent's card too. So then on subsequent turns you can add to your army here, uh, always adding the same color there and then the number of orcs there is going to sort of be your battle strength uh, for calculating who is going to win the territory. After you've played your orc card, then you're going to draw cards from these stockpiles, and it's going to be based upon the number of orcs that you're playing uh, to your territory, either one or two. If you have played two orcs, then you're just going to draw one of these cards, and if you've played one orc, then you're going to draw two. And you can pick from whatever stockpile you want, uh, and then take that into your hand. Now the interesting thing here is that these stockpiles are sort of the timer uh, as to how scoring is triggered for each of these territories. So once all of the cards are gone that are next to a particular territory, then that territory is going to score. And uh, you will essentially just take and add up the total number of orcs that are on each side in the color that they're fighting with. So in this case, the green orcs here that are uh, the two orcs versus these four blue orcs, the blue win. And so they're gonna win this territory. So you'll take up all the cards except for one and then you'll put a little spear there to indicate that this player has won that territory. Gameplay will continue until all six territories have been claimed by one player or the other. And you're going to get two points if you have claimed a territory that has two orcs on the card here, and one point if you have a territory that has one orc on the card. Additionally, each player is going to look at their, the hand of cards that they have left over at the end of the game, and they're going to get points uh, for every orc that they have that matches a color of a territory that they claimed. Uh, both players will add up their score, and whoever has the most will be the winner of orc. So let's take a look at Jim. Jim is a game about being on the schoolyard and picking teams and playing through some sporting events. And so the first phase of the game is the pick phase where you're gonna be uh, picking your kids that are gonna be on your team. Uh, these uh, cards have, the kids have different abilities in different sports and they have two abilities and uh, they're also bully cards that have just one ability and you can tell by the pictures that they don't look too happy to be on the playground playing. Uh, they also have some little special abilities that they can do. But you'll just go back and forth uh, picking, a, picking cards and picking your teams. And whenever a bully is selected, then you have an opportunity to manipulate which events are going to get played. There's six of them, and they're randomly put in an order here from top to bottom at the beginning. But then when you play a bully, you have the opportunity to either slide two of these events one space forward, you can sort of see they have three little markings there, one space forward, or one event you can move two spaces forward. 
The idea being that by the time you get through uh, drafting all of these cards and playing all six of the bully cards, these are going to be all in different uh, configurations here, uh, different uh, uh, positions on the track, if you will. And so based upon where they are in, in position here, you're going to pick four of these events to be the ones that are played out during the play phase. So this, uh, this one's gone the farthest, so that one's picked, this one is picked, and this one is picked. And then if there's a tie here at the end, you're going to go with the one that's at the top. So these two four events here are going to be the ones that are played during the play phase. The other two events are turned over. They become coaches that are going to be used during the play phase to prevent shenanigans from going on. So let's take a look at the play phase. So you picked your teams and now it's time to get on the playground and uh, play out your, your events and see how things go. So uh, during the play phase, you're going to lay out these four events here well, and you'll have two sides. And on your turn, you're going to be playing kids out of your hand and playing them two particular events. And what you're trying to do is match up the abilities that the, car, that the uh, kids have with the events. And that's how you're going to eventually score points. So you're going to be playing these cards out and uh, one at a time. But as you're playing them out, there's also the uh, special abilities that can be played. And you'll see that each of these colors has an ability that's associated with it. And all of these abilities have something to do with uh, moving the cards around and manipulating the condition of the board. So they may involve like taking two cards and swapping them, swapping sides with them, or taking two cards that are on the same side and swapping them. Uh, it might involve lifting a card up from uh, the, the board and placing another one down. So there's all these different ways that you can manipulate the board um, in, in your favor so that you'll end up with the highest value of that color on your side. Um, now there's also the coach cards here and they're there to prevent any uh, shenanigans and goings on during the, um, uh, the playing of your events there. So whenever a bully card is played, the, that gets played down and then you can move one of the coaches to one side of a particular event. And when, when that coach is placed there, um, it pretty much prevents any special abilities from being played at that location. So you'll continue playing all of these cards uh, until there's 12 cards on each side and then you're going to add up the points in that color on each side. And um, you'll add those up and the score for that particular event is the difference between the two uh, values. So, uh, you know, if this player has the most points, they're gonna win, but they're not gonna get that many points. They're going to get whatever the difference is between this side and this side. And then you'll add up the score for all four of the events, and whoever has uh, the most points is gonna be the winner of Jim. So this is Rum. This is a set collection game where you're trying to lay down sets of cards to be able to claim these captain cards, which are going to be of increasing values over the course of the game. Uh, you have a face down pile of cards called the Shipwreck, and then you have uh, three cards face up in front of you called the Beach. And this is a kind of a common uh, area that people can uh, take cards from. Um, and then you have the, what's called the Castaway Clock. That's this one here. We'll talk about that in a second. Each player is going to start off with one card in their hand, and on your turn you can do one of two things. You can either take a card or you can play a set. You can either take a card by taking a one of the face down cards from the shipwreck and putting it into your hand, uh, or you can take one of these face up beach cards and put it into your hand. If you take one of these cards, then it's going to be replaced with a face down card uh, from the, the shipwreck. If you're ever in a situation where all of these cards have been taken and you have all three of these uh, face down, you're going to turn it over and it's like the tides washing in, <laughs> and then you'll get a new set of beach cards here. Um, what you're going to do uh, if you don't take a card is you can play a set in order to claim one of these captain cards. And you have to be able to claim one of those cards to, um, uh, to be able to take it. So uh, you'll just play a set of cards in front of you. Like in this case, I have uh, played two orange cards, and that would allow me to take this orange captain's card. Now you can see on these cards they have uh, values of one through four, and you kind of will rotate the card one, two, three, four, and then there's a, on the back they go all the way up to eight. But they start off with a value of one, and so in order to claim this card, you have to have a set that's higher than one. So all you would need is two bottles to be able to claim any one of these. So I have two orange bottles here, so I could claim this card, and uh, I would move it to the two, and then I would place it in front of me. But another thing to keep in mind is that these cards that are in the beach are also considered to be kind of communal cards that you can use in your sets. So here I've got an orange card here as well. So I actually have a set of one, two, three orange cards that I'm playing. So I could take this in front of me and instead put it to a value of three. So that'll stay in front of me until someone else steals it by playing a set that's higher than that. So these cards are going to be sort of traded around among the players, getting higher and higher in values, and you're going to keep track of your score in front of you 
because the first player uh, in a two-player game to 21 points, uh, 18 points in a three-player game, 15 points in a four-player game is going to be the winner of the game. There's a couple of other elements at play here, though. We have something called the parrot card and that's going to be face down here somewhere in the shipwreck and at some point during the game someone may draw the parrot card and at that point whoever drew the parrot card is going to have to discard out of their hand a number of cards that are shown on this castaway clock on this side of the castaway clock it's two cards on this side it's three cards so that player would have to discard two cards out of their hand um, and then this castaway clock would then rotate and uh, would go to the two value. So this would kind of continue on, and if the if uh, the uh, and so every time that the parrot is taken, then then that's going to, what's going to happen is this clock is going to rotate. So if uh, a player doesn't get up to that threshold to win the game, then the game will also end whenever the castaway clock gets to the eight value, the little picture of a pirate ship here. The other thing to keep in mind in this game is that there's a special set of cards that they call the Rum Trio, and that's a any a set here that is three single bottles of the same color. And so uh, that is a special set because there's only three single, for example, green bottles in the entire deck of cards. And so if you can play this in front of you, then you can take that green card, no matter what value it's set on, you can steal it from another player and then increase it by two. So let's say that this card was already out of five. Well, then I could use a rum trio to steal it from another player and increase it to a seven and then put it down in front of me. So the rum trio can be a real uh, effective way of getting additional points in the game without having to collect a whole lot of cards. So all uh, w w the game is going to continue until one of those uh, conditions is met. Either the castaway clock gets to the end of the line there, or one player gets to the uh, victory threshold, and then that will be the winner of rum. So last but not least, we have Sow, which is a game about uh, harvesting flowers. And you have all these cards that have uh, pictures of seed packets on them in different colors. And at the beginning of the game, each player will choose one of these wheelbarrows to sit in front of. And underneath the wheelbarrow is going to be a secret color that's your secret favorite flower color. So the goal of the game is that you're trying to turn these seed packets into flowers, and then you're trying to get uh, as many of the flowers of your secret color as possible into your bouquet, because that's how you're going to score points in this game. Now the way that you do that is by a very interesting Mancala-like mechanic, if you ever played that game, where on your turn you're going to take all of one row of cards, it has to be at least two cards in, in the row, and then you're going to distribute those cards around the circle in whatever, or, whatever uh, direction is shown by this windmill card here. In this case this is clockwise. So then I would take one card and put it here, and one card and put it here. If the last card that's played in a row is a seed packet, you'd flip it over and then it becomes a flower. You'll also flip over all of the other seed packets in the row that are that color. So I'd flip this other yellow one as well. Um, later on in the game it'll continue and eventually the flowers will start moving around the row and if you ever get a, place a flower as the last card that's in a row then what you're going to do is you're going to look at that flower and pick one of the two colors either the inside or the petals and then you're going to take all of the flowers of that color from this row and you're going to give it to whoever, whoever this wheelbarrow belongs to so it might be yours but it might actually be another player's too but they, they will get all of those flowers so in this case I chose yellow this card is a yellow yellow uh, flower in the middle, uh, take this one, this one, and this one, and give it to the player who, um, who has this wheelbarrow. Not going to do them a whole lot of good because they're looking for blue, but uh, the, that player may not know that. So this is going to continue until um, enough flowers have been taken to where uh, there aren't um, any rows that have at least two cards in them anymore. And then uh, what you'll do is tally up your points. You'll get points for having your favorite color in the petals, and you'll get even more points for having your favorite color uh, in the center part of the, of the um, flower. Um, also of note, there is these two cards here, the, the windmill card and the gopher watering can card. One side's gopher, one side's watering can. If on a turn, yeah, those cards ever end up in the same row, then you're going to flip the watering can, I'm sorry, the windmill cards so that the direction of turns is going to go backwards. And then also this little gopher card uh, will allow you to, um, the active player, to take all of the flowers out of one row. Then it's going to flip over to a watering can action, and the next time that comes around and they end up in the same row, the watering can will allow you to pluck one flower in front of you and put it into your bouquet. So all different sorts of ways here of trying to get those flowers into your hand, um, and then uh, whoever has the most beautiful bouquet uh, will be the winner of so.
One of the things that I love about games is the fact that there seems to be a game for just about any social situation these days. Whether you have two players or 20 players, uh, you want something that's five minutes long or three hours long, it seems like there's a game out there that fits the bill these days. And the bill that the Paco Game Set 2 fits is the little uh, five to 20 minute filler game uh, that you can pull out, teach really quickly, play really quickly, and put away. And this little micro format here in this tiny little pack, it just takes this all to a new level. I mean, the fact that I can fit all four of these games in the palm of my hand uh, is just amazing. And my favorite part about these games is the fact that these are not throwaway little luck-based garbage games. These are games where Chris Handy has taken a, a great amount of care in making sure that these are gamer games that have a st um, amount of strategic depth to them. And so, you know, these aren't just, just luck-based games. These are games where we have to make some interesting decisions. And so I think it's great to have that in such a small package. Now, are these all Sp uh, Spiel des Jahres uh, nominees? No, um, and some are better than others. Uh, for me, the, for this particular set, my favorite game was Orc, uh, which is sort of like a really uh, easier version of uh, Reiner Knizia's Battle Line, um, and I, which is a game that I really enjoy. And uh, so my wife and I really liked playing this one because it just takes five, about five to ten minutes to play one game. You can play multiple games at a time, and it's just a nice, fun little filler game. Now, games like Jim and So have uh, a lot more depth to them and uh, a lot of more indirect card manipulation stuff going on that might be a little bit harder to figure out. But I think that's kind of cool because it means that I want to play these again uh, to be able to sort of figure that out. And then Rum is just a real simple uh, set collection game, and I, I grew up playing Rummy, uh, the card game, and so uh, I found that this one was a lot of fun too. So I really don't have anything bad to say about these games. I think they're great, and for the price point, you just really can't go wrong. I mean, these, I think these are like six bucks a piece, uh, and you can also get them into a, in a set uh, together, and so I, I just think they're a really great addition to your collection because it just provides some versatility when you're in those social situations and you need to pull out a game at the airport or you're having lunch with a friend, and you, you know, when the moment strikes you, you can just pull these things out and get them to the table and they're an awful lot of fun. So uh, I would highly recommend checking out and adding your collection, uh, Paco Game Set 2.